Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, just delaying here as I see the numbers of people logging into the webinar. Um, happy for you to join us for this very important um, Policy Center webinar, uh, where we will be diving into J Street's latest uh, policy proposal that uh, was circulated earlier this week. Um, my name is Adina vogel Ayalone, um, Vice President and Chief of Staff at J Street, and I am honored to be here moderating this webinar um, with two of my wonderful colleagues, uh, as well as an honorary colleague and a, and a good friend, uh, and I will introduce them in just a moment. Uh, but I will also just uh, introduce a little bit of the, of the topic and framing for our discussion. We will have the opportunity to um, ask our panelists some specific questions about what J Street exactly is proposing and also how this is perceived by Israelis and Palestinians. And I, of course, want to encourage all of you to ask questions um, and to put those questions in the q and I know we have received a lot of questions and we hope to try and cover as much territory as we can um, in, this, in this webinar. Um, so, of course, we are all aware that we are still in the midst of the Israel-Hamas war. Um, of course, the sentiment in Israel still is a sentiment of, of grief um, and mourning uh, the loss of their loved ones um, on and since October 7th, um, still grappling with the horror of that day and the trauma and, and sense of insecurity. Um, Palestinians in Gaza, of course, are in the midst um, of their grief and trauma and insecurity and um, daily seeking ways to survive the absolutely horrific consequences of the of the war and the dire humanitarian situation in the strip in the strip and of course um the situation on the west bank um for palestinians uh has been quite volatile um and that is where uh nidal is is joining us from today um so you can probably can touch on that perhaps maybe in the in the q a um but of course many people um are very skeptical that now uh, is the time to even be having this discussion the discussion that we're having today um is it the time for a u.s administration to lead um a bold initiative um and at j street we feel uh that that this this is a time uh, we must not give up and we cannot um, turn uh, turn away from the tragedy and we need to turn things around um, and build a better future that will be a better and secure future for Israelis and Palestinians uh, and we are here to discuss our new uh, newest policy uh, proposal uh, in which we are calling on the Biden administration to outline a bold and comprehensive regional peace initiative aim at solving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as well as the broader Israeli-Arab conflicts. Uh, we do feel that it is time for a major shift in U.S. policy, um, and a centerpiece of this shift is an unprecedented offer of U.S. recognition of the state of Palestine um, prior to such recognition by Israel. And of course, my colleague, Dr. Deborah Shushan, will go into more details about this specific proposal. Um, and all of the different conditions necessary to reach it. I want to encourage you, if you have not already, to read um, the Policy Center issue brief, which outlines the proposal as well as our FAQ. Um, and if you don't receive our publications, please do sign up for our webpage and my colleagues will, my colleagues on the back end uh, will put in those links into the chat uh, so that you can make sure to have those resources. So I will introduce um, our wonderful panelists. Uh, I will start with um, the, the honorary member of the J Street team. I will start with Nidal, uh, who is the Director General of the Palestinian Peace Coalition, Geneva Initiative um, in Ramallah. And he is the head of also the Palestinian Israeli Peace and Geo Forum's political commission, as well as the deputy chairman and founder of Freedom Forum Palestine, an organization that promotes civil liberties in Palestine. Uh, thank you, Nidal, for being with us um, at night um, over in Ramallah. And uh, we also have with us uh, Nadav Tamir, who is joining us from Israel, um, from his home. And he is the director, executive director of J Street in Israel. Uh, he previously served in multiple roles in the foreign ministry, um, <clears throat> including political officer at the Israeli embassy in Washington, D.C., and as the Israeli consul general to New England. Um, and Dr. Deborah Shushan, who is our director of policy at J Street. Uh, she heads up our J Street Policy Center. And of course, many of you are uh, probably know her well from her Shushan Street column um, and other J Street Policy Center publications. She was previously a government professor at the College of William and Mary, teaching Middle East politics and international relations. Um, so, so 
happy to be moderating this webinar with the three of you. So, Deborah, I'm going to turn it over to you first to lay out for us what exactly this bold initiative for comprehensive regional peace actually is. Thanks so much, Adina. Uh, and it is, uh, it's very exciting to actually be on a J Street webinar as a panelist for a change and to, to hand over the moderating reins to you. Uh, and great to be here with Nidal and Nadav. Uh, so, so let me uh, uh, lay out a little bit what we're talking about in terms of J Street's uh, new initiative. What we are calling for is a comprehensive regional peace initiative that is aimed at nothing less than resolving the Israeli-Palestinian and also the broader Israeli-Arab conflicts. And what we are recommending is that this process be jump-started with, as Adina said, the unprecedented offer of American recognition of the state of Palestine, conditional on the Palestinians meeting certain requirements prior to such recognition by Israel. Uh, so in other words, this would mean uh, that the destination uh, of this process, two states would be clear up front, uh, and there would not be an Israeli veto over uh, Palestinian statehood, though, as I said, there would be conditions, uh, very important conditions that the Palestinians would need to meet. Now, uh, we have outlined, as you'll see in our issue brief, uh, a series of recommended steps. Uh, these are these are recommendations. You know, doesn't have to be exactly in this order, but uh, you know what we are putting out as as food for thought to policymakers of the steps that we do think need to happen and an order in which they could happen. So the first thing that would need to happen, Adina, would be. Uh, to first secure a step in the fighting and obviously the release of the hostages that continue to be held in Gaza uh, by Hamas and other militants there. During this stop in the fighting, uh, there would be a surge in humanitarian aid to Gaza, which we all know is desperately needed, and the laying out by the United States of a comprehensive regional peace initiative. So that would be the first step. The second step would be to ask uh, the Israelis on the one hand and the Palestinians on the other hand for a set of parallel steps that each side would unilaterally take. Uh, these are on the Israeli side. These are uh, steps that I think are are well known in terms of, for example, uh, what would need to happen on the West Bank uh, and and other steps that the Israelis would need to take for the Palestinians. Uh, again, a series of uh, of steps that would be quite important. Uh, then after those steps taken by Israelis and Palestinians, uh, and after the, the certification in particular of those steps uh, that the Palestinian leadership would have taken, that would be the time for recognition of Palestine, uh, the state of Palestine, by the United States, hopefully also, and I think also, uh, by partners. And it's, you know, so that it wouldn't be something that the United States government would be doing alone. And at the same time, a reissuing uh, by the Arab League of the Arab Peace Initiative, uh, which I think probably everyone knows this is the API was initially issued in 2002 by the Arab League, led by Saudi Arabia, which put on the table full regional uh, normalization with Israel, full relations uh, in return for recognition of Palestinian statehood, uh, roughly along the 1967 lines, uh, potentially with land swaps, et cetera. So we we would hope that at that stage, along with recognition of Palestine, would be the reissuing of the Arab Peace Initiative, that key offer to Israel by the broader Arab world. Now, following that, 
there would be negotiations, which would happen on two tracks. Uh, so the Israeli-Palestinian track would negotiate uh, final status issues and the end to that conflict. And it, I think it's it's important to note that U.S. recognition of Palestine would not be determinative of those final status issues that would be negotiated directly between the Israelis and Palestinians. And at the same time, there would be a second track, uh, which would be Israeli, Saudi, and broader Israeli Arab normalization uh, as well, which would be a major uh, incentive and carrot, hopefully, uh, for the Israeli people that, you know, that um, ending the Israeli-Palestinian conflict uh, would be part of this broader, comprehensive regional process. And then the last step that we envision would be U.S. congressional action necessary to enable U.S. commitments to both sides, uh, to both the Israelis, the Palestinians, and also to Arab states uh, that are taking key steps along the way vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Israelis and also Gaza reconstruction, uh, et cetera. So, and that would also support Palestinian admission uh, to the UN as a member state, which would be part of that last step. I just want to note uh, that we uh, at J Street presented this plan at our J Street Policy Center symposium that we held just two days ago uh, on crafting a path forward out of this conflict and moving toward conflict resolution to states as part of this comprehensive regional package. Uh, and I want to note as well uh, that there is recent reporting that does indicate that the Biden administration is already moving in the direction that J Street is advocating. Uh, there's an important piece in the Washington Post just today that I hope my colleagues will put into the chat that indicates that the U.S. and a number of key Arab states, uh, specifically Egypt and Jordan, which of course already have uh, peace treaties with Israel, as well as the Saudis, Qatar, the UAE, Palestinian representatives uh, are, uh, as the pursuit of a deal is happening to try to pause fighting for at least six weeks and lead to the release of the hostages, these parties are already talking about the opening for a post-war uh, moving forward to solve uh, these conflicts. Um, I will note uh, the danger uh, that's that's noted in the Washington Post piece. That's what about what is happening in Rafa and the possibility that that could derail all of these very important developments. But we are very pleased to see that there is movement along exactly the lines that we're talking about here. Thank you so much, Deborah, for laying that out so clearly and also for noting um, that piece in the Washington Post, which I think is really important. Um, Nadav, I want to turn to you. Um, and I know that uh, you obviously have been very active and Nadav has been been volunteering in a, an integral part of the Hostage Families Forum in Israel um, and very active in, in pursuing also um, and supporting families who are standing up in support for a negotiated stop to fighting and a, a release of the hostages. And I, I want to ask you about Israeli public opinion relating to this proposal that we laid out, uh, especially at such a sensitive time. Um, there's reason polling indicating that the public has shifted further to the right um, as a reaction to the October 7th Hamas massacre. Um, and and Obviously, we've seen the statements of the uh, Israeli leaders that are uh, very much dismissing the concept of Palestinian statehood. Um, and many in the Israeli public don't really want to talk about the possibility of, of two states uh, recognizing a Palestinian state and also viewing it perhaps as a, as a gift to Hamas uh, following the October 7th massacre. Can you respond to this? What is the Israeli public opinion on the issue of statehood? Yeah, absolutely. It's it's very true that both Israelis and Palestinians, and, and Nidal will speak for the Palestinians, but both uh, move to a more hawkish place, uh, which is usually what's happening during a war, especially when Palestinians see the horrors in Gaza, in Al Jazeera, and Israelis see their own pain 
uh, you know, and, and uh, not the other side pain, and everybody are very in their insecurities and traumas, like you said, Dina. Um, but we have to remember that this is usually what happened in the times of war. And if you would have ask Israelis uh, during the Yom Kippur War uh, in 73 with the Egyptians, if uh, anyone would believe that uh, uh, there will be peace with Egypt, um, you know, a few years afterwards, or if anyone would believe that uh, there will be the Oslo Initiative after the trauma of the First Intifada, or that there will be a withdrawal from Gaza after the Second Intifada, nobody would believe because Israelis and Palestinians right now are in a sense of, uh, you know, of confusion. And, uh, and what we uh, in J Street called America to do is to lead. Leadership is not about checking uh, what's the mood like of a weather vane. It's more holding a compass and leading to where we want to be. Uh, and uh, we believe that this place where the U.S. should lead is good for both Israelis and Palestinians. And again, I don't need to speak for Palestinians because Nidal is here. But for me, as a, as a Zionist, I do believe that uh, not using this tragedy into a change of course, uh, because the, the course that we were on we, is leading us to a, a one-state catastrophe, which is, a, 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 you know, bad for Israelis and Palestinians. Um, and you said about rewarding Hamas. So no, Hamas does not want normalization. Hamas does not want a, a revitalized Palestinian authority taking over in Gaza. Hamas want chaos, just like the Israeli extremists want chaos. So this is not a reward for Hamas. This is exactly the opposite because the approach that we had before October 7th, uh, that the Netanyahu government was in, in a way rewarding Hamas and keeping the PA high and dry did not work. This is one of the concepts that uh, were trashed in October 7th. So this move is actually exactly the opposite. It's not empowering Hamas, it's empowering people like Nidal who want the two-state solution, who are against terrorism. And, they, and for so many years, the, the Israeli, you know, the American administration said, we cannot want it more than the sides. So we will wait until there is leadership that will do it. And there is no leadership. In Israel, we have the most right-wing government ever. In, in Ramallah, unfortunately, we have a leadership that lost legitimacy among its own people. And that's why you need the international leadership and only the U.S. could lead uh, to that, uh, and uh, and I, I believe that uh, you know, in times of earthquakes, this is when people move out of their comfort zone, and this is exactly the time to lead. And especially after everybody saw that this conflict has spillover effects, that it you know it affects the Iran uh, arena and and the Babel Mandab arena and the Ukraine Russia war. So the U.S. cannot say anymore where we were not, we cannot uh, uh, want it more than the sides, but actually lead to a place that is good for the U.S., good for the world, good for Palestinians, and good for Israelis. Thanks so much, Nadav. Before I turn to you, Nadav, I just want to ask you, Nadav, just another specific question um, about the full package that um, that Deborah laid out, um, which includes you know, return of the hostages, normalization with Saudi Arabia, and also a stipulation of the Palestinian state uh, being demilitarized. Those are all things that I know um, have been recently appeared in some polling. Can you talk a little bit about um, how the Israeli public looks at this package that is essentially laid out uh, in our proposal uh, in, in a few words before I turn to Nidal? First of all, uh, there is a lot of confusion because it, it, it's different uh, according to the question that you ask. If you ask Israelis just about a Palestinian state, it's very negative. But if you ask them about a situation where there is a demilitarized Palestinian state, there is a Saudi normalization with Israel, there is a new kind of um, a alliance of the moderates in the region against Iran and its proxies, then people uh, move very uh, to a different place. And, and Geneva did, um, the Israeli side of Geneva did uh, uh, a survey like that. And when you ask the question with all the attributes that uh, Deborah uh, described, then the reaction is much more positive. And I believe that it will be much more positive when the international community will move in that direction because it's important to understand 
that uh, what Biden has right now is a very unique situation in Israeli public opinion, which, for example, Obama never had. Because he embraced us in such an amazing way, and he was the father figure for Israelis when they did not have a father figure of their own in the most traumatic times, the leverage, the leadership of, of the U.S. is so important and can really change public opinion in Israel. Uh, because people now uh, see uh, that Biden is a great friend. They understand that America is our best friend, unlike the, all the talks before that maybe Putin, maybe Trump. Now everybody understands that Biden is the real friend. And if Biden will be able to use that leverage uh, after embracing Israel and also giving the Palestinians a political horizon, I think that it will also be good for him politically at home. Um, uh, but but of course, the Americans here could speak better about the American politics than me. Thanks so much, Nadav. Um, okay, Nidal, I'm going to ask you um, a series of questions that we've been getting um, relating to how Palestinians would perceive the package that that Deborah has has outlined. Um, the first question relates to the the conditions that relate to U.S. recognition of Palestinian statehood, um, and there are se several things that relate to things that would be actions that the PLO or the PA would be um, would have to take. Um, this also includes demilitarization. This relates to democratic reforms. Um, so how do the Palestinians, would they perceive those specific conditions? Um, and are there Palestinians that are prepared to lead um, the type of Palestinian state that is outlined uh, in those conditions? Well, good evening. Thank you so much, uh, Adina, and uh, thank you, Jen Street, for uh, hosting this important uh, meeting and for making this four points proposal, which I believe very relevant. Uh, and I believe for a person like me, I can comfortably live with and I, I can even contribute uh, to out louding it and making it more more vocal even among the Palestinians. Uh, you, you know, when it comes uh, to the conditions on the Palestinian side, as a Palestinian, I believe the majority of those conditions are originally Palestinian demands. When it comes to the Palestinians, when, when it comes to the constituency, issues that relate to uh, reviving the Palestinian Authority issues that relate to uh, reforms are among the uh, their Palestinian demands nowadays in the West Bank, as well as in the Gaza Strip. So when it comes to those issues that relate, for instance, to changes in the government, changes of uh, ministers, issues related to uh, legal and administrative uh, reforms, combating uh, corruption, you know, the issue of incitement, I believe the issue of incitement and uh, combating incitement used to be always a Palestinian demand. And even repeatedly, there were this Palestinian call for reactivating this trilateral uh, anti-incitement committee, which uh, some days uh, ago has been, you know, proposed and never uh, worked. So all those, all those conditions, further to the issue of a demilitarized Palestinian state would be comfortably and positively perceived by the Palestinians at the level of the public opinion and at the level of the leading circles in Palestine when they will come within a sort of a package that will lead to the end of the conflict and an establishment of a Palestinian state. On your question, whether there is Palestinians who are willing to read to lead within such conditions, my my direct answer is yes. Uh, I be, I believe any future Palestinian elections, which is also a dire need, the issue of democratic change, is a, a requirement for the Palestinians. Unfortunately, the circumstances which have been created since October 7 until today are not conducive to elections for two reasons. First of all, the technical aspect. It's not possible for the Palestinians 
within the coming few months to convene elections mainly in Gaza. But also the situation is also in the West Bank a bit problematic because of the settler violence and because of the new Israeli policies that target the West Bank. Uh, further, you know, immediately after the war and with this high polarization among the Palestinians and people as Nadav tried to present it became a bit more hawkish, it's not wise to take them from a time of a severe and bloody round of violence, war, and to elections, especially when you, you, when you know uh, Hamas is being presented in a, such a way or another through certain media outlets, local or regional, are the ones who resist the Israeli aggression on, on Gaza. And once there will be uh, an integral package of a new government, a program, a Marshall program, the way also included in, in the proposal, definitely within this context, within this context, a new Palestinian leadership who can live and who can lead with such conditions is very potential and possible to be reached. Thanks so much, Nidal. Um, there's a there's a there's a couple of questions I actually want to follow up on before um, I will turn back to Deborah. Um, there are questions that relate specifically to um, the release of prisoners that has been discussed in the in the current um, negotiations, um, and specifically relating to Marwan Barghouti, and wondering how Marwan Barghouti would fit in to the proposal that we are uh, discussing here, if at all, um, from your perspective and from the Palestinian public's perspective, as, as uh, he continues to be a very popular figure among the Palestinian public. And, um, and then also, I would ask, in addition to touching on that, um, also ask you to touch on, from your perspective, how to, um, how to deal with Hamas in a proposal that is outlined um, as, as we have outlined? Well, you know, on, uh, on the first part of the question, the one that relates to prisoners' release and specifically Marwan Barouti, you know, for me, I'm not concerned about, you know, uh, the beliefs of Marwan Barouti as a person. Marwan Barouti in the past, uh, before uh, he was arrested by Israel for a long time. He was affiliated actually also uh, to the moderate camp in Palestine. And uh, so many Israelis knows Marwan al barghouti personally, uh, and they had with him a certain experience of dialogue and initiating certain uh, plans or proposals. So Marwan is a type of person with whom you can uh, achieve a progress and probably also reach something. But Marwan is very uh, popular among the Palestinians. Today, you know, uh, all public opinion polls gives Marwan a high percentage of popularity and support. Uh, I'm a bit concerned actually about the circumstances of releasing Marwan Barghouti. You know, uh, nowadays, the fact that after more than 20, 20 years, Marwan Barghouti will be released through Hamas and through a deal, uh, a prisoner's swap, where all previous uh, rounds of talks between the Palestinian Authority and Israel and the attempts to release Palestinian prisoners as part of the peace negotiations failed to release a single prisoner. And now Hamas will come back with hundreds or probably thousands of Palestinian prisoners, including heavy weight prisoners, probably this in a way or influence, uh, in a way or another, affect, you know, their future positions. But definitely to, not to the extent that Marwan Barghouti or those who belong to Fatah will become Hamas. So uh, in this regard, uh, I believe, I believe, uh, you know, he is he is a, a potential person, and he can be among, you know, uh, the people who could also contribute to the future leadership of the Palestinian Authority. 
Thank you. Um, I'm going to come back to you, um, to, to you, I think, and adopt to talk about spoilers. But first, I want to go to Deborah because we've gotten a lot of very specific questions relating to final status issues and core issues related to the conflict. Um, how does our proposal address those core issues? Thanks, Adina. So first, let me say this. Our proposal makes very clear that final status issues will be determined in negotiations between Israelis and Palestinians. So let's start with that. Now, having said that, uh, J Street does have longstanding positions, policy positions on these particular issues. Uh, we do see East Jerusalem uh, as the future capital of a Palestinian state. I would note that the Washington Post piece that I referenced in my earlier remarks um, also deals with, talks about the issue of Jerusalem and how it's being broached right now in conversations that the United States is having with international partners. Uh, and one of the things that is being discussed there, uh, which has you know, also been discussed in previous talks, is the possibility that the old city which would remain contiguous to Israel could be a special zone with uh, with international monitoring as part of that. That is certainly something that we are open to. But once again, going back to the original point, right? These are topics uh, for negotiations between Israelis and Palestinians regarding the right of return. Uh, J Street's position on this is long established. Uh, and that position is that the Palestinian right of return uh, will overwhelmingly be to the new Palestinian state. They will have their right to return there. Uh, we are certainly open to, as has been discussed in previous negotiations, a certain you know, small symbolic return uh, of a small number of Palestinians to the state of Israel, uh, certainly the issue of compensation uh, for Palestinian refugees should certainly be on the table. Again, these are these are subjects uh, for future negotiations, Adina. Thank you so much, Deborah. Um, and uh, Nadav, I'm going to I'm going to turn to you um, with a, a question um, about our proposal in terms of ensuring security guarantees um, for Israel. So our proposal does offer Palestinians a Marshall Plan style effort to rebuild Gaza and of course build up also the West Bank. What are the other types of external security guarantees that it offers Israel beyond the expectations relating to Palestinian reform? How was the, would this proposal ensure Israeli security? Well, I think that many Israelis um, learned from too many commentators on TV and uh, former generals that security is only a military issue, but it's not. Actually, what, uh, what the Biden doctrine, as Tom Friedman calls it, uh, uh, gives Israel is a much more secure situation because there's no military way to defeat uh, Hamas. Hamas is a movement and we could kill many of them, but eventually Hamas will stay. The only way um, uh, to really uh, uh, deal with the spoilers is through a diplomatic strategy that includes the regional uh, players. And uh, the regional players could, could provide a lot of security for both Israelis and Palestinians. We see it also with the peace that we have in, with Egypt and Jordan that eventually the diplomatic deal is what provides security. Um, and, and the thought that security is only a, a matter of uh, tanks and soldiers is, is completely wrong. Uh, the US learned it in Iraq and Afghanistan and Vietnam, and I learned it in Lebanon, that you could not achieve security just by military. Uh, so I actually believe that this plan that will empower moderate Palestinians uh, that will be able to uh, take over uh, uh, fr in Gaza and in the West Bank, uh, and that they uh, will be empowered by the regional and international player, players is the best security for Israel. And the only way, uh, it, we do have a very sophisticated military, no doubt, even though the uh, fiasco of October 7th, 
Uh, but what one of the things that we learned in October 7th, that even the most sophisticated military cannot protect us without diplomatic agreements. And this is exactly what this initiative is, is to uh, defeat Hamas by other means, uh, by, by empowering the, the good guys uh, and uh, by creating a regional infrastructure that will also be an alliance against Iran and its proxies and others uh, in a much more effective way. Thanks so much, um, Nadav. Uh, Nidal, I want to just go back to the, to, to the basics, which is um, why is this type of a proposal so significant for Palestinians? And would Palestinians see this type of a proposal as a significant shift um, in, in the policy that uh, the U.S. has essentially advanced uh, over the past several decades? Well, let me just... Uh... Uh, I skipped I skipped the previous question on Hamas, but in 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 a couple of minutes uh, on the status ha of Hamas and the future of Hamas. Y you know, I firmly believe what we Palestinians failed to achieve during the last seventeen years when it comes to an internal Palestinian reconciliation and end of the intra-Palestinian split, and agree on a certain uh, political common ground, what we could not achieve, we'll not be able to achieve it today. Uh, you know, because, you know, this, th there is nowadays this conversation and this argument whether, whether uh, we, can, we can find a, a certain formula with which Hamas can accept the PLO and the PLO can absorb Hamas. There is a deep uh, crack and uh, you know uh, the the distance between the ideological positions of Hamas and the PLO positions are uh, too wide, which cannot be which cannot be bridged. The future the future of the movement. I myself I do not believe that it, at the short run there is a chance for Hamas to be part of any Palestinian political structures, but. Hamas will remain, will remain as a social, uh, religious, uh, you know, at the level of the grassroots, Hamas will remain. Hamas do exist in the West Bank, in the Gaza Strip, in the Arab world, but also all around the world. You know, this is an ideological uh, movement. Uh, I believe, you know, and relating back uh, to 1996, Hamas made a decision at that time that they will not be part of this Palestinian authority, and they will not compete for a new uh, for a Palestinian elections. I think the the best formula for any future uh, position from Hamas is to copy the position of the 1996 for Hamas not to run for elections, to take a break, to go through a certain internal review to repackage itself. Uh, you know, definitely following the war, there will be so many questions which need to be answered, whether internally, within Hamas, or among the Palestinians. So this is, this is really extremely important. Uh, on the United States position, I believe this is uh, a very important and significant shift. The fact that uh, we hear Palestinians and probably the rest of the world today that the United States is considering a recognition of the state of Palestine probably before the end of 2024, this by itself is a, a, pro, a, a, pro, a progress step which is important and it will encourage also other players, regional and international, Let's not forget that in 2011, there were a Palestinian attempt to gain recognition through the UN, the UN Security Council. And the one who obstructed and opposed actually such a move is the United States. The United States stand uh, in the face of the Palestinian effort and obstructed the effort which pushed the Palestinians to return back a year later to the UN General Assembly to get a vote on the recognition of Palestine as an unmember state. This will open 
the door for the Palestinians within the UN Security Council. This recognition will also define the framework of any future peace deal between the Palestinians and Israelis. It will be an pillar for any future negotiations between Palestinians and Israelis to reach the two-state solution since it will be known in advance that the ultimate goal will be an independent Palestinian state. And if we ensure the recognition by the United States and then automatically so many countries, mainly European countries will follow the United States, then definitely, definitely, they'll, this will help in uh, developing a certain comfortable framework for negotiation and reaching an agreement. Thank you, Nidal. Um, and, and just going back to what you had been saying about um, Hamas, and this leads into a question that I want to ask you, Nadav. You know, of course, the, the concept of possibly seeing Hamas be reintegrated as a political party um, into a Palestinian governing structure would be very concerning um, for Israelis. And of course, the need to separate um, Hamas's military wing from their political wing in that process would be obviously key um, to even opening a door to thinking about this, but I, I, I do believe that this is a, a great challenge um, that is probably one of the first things that would be pointed to by, by right-wing Israelis, and we already know that even the talk of, of Palestinian statehood um, is already something that they don't uh, that they don't even want to entertain. So Nadav, I would love for you to just touch on how do you tackle some of those challenges that come from the Israeli government right now, but not only from the Israeli government, also from members of, of the opposition um, that are more labeled as, as centrists, like, uh, like Yair Lapid, um, or even those that are as part of this unity government like, uh, like Gantz and Eisenkot. How would they view this type of a proposal and how do you overcome the spoilers of the, of the extreme right? So first of all, uh, as Nidal said, uh, Hamas is part of the Palestinian society, whether we want it or not. It's not going to change. I mean, according to Khalil Shkaki's polls, we know that when there is a political horizon, Hamas uh, number is shrinking. We also know from Khalil Shkaki that unlike in Israel, in Palestine, uh, young people tend to be less religious than their parents. So, uh, you know, the trend could change. And uh, we know that there are some, you know, we have Mansour Abbas, who's also part of the Muslim Brotherhood uh, movement, but he's, uh, uh, you know, but he's uh, very much against terrorism and he's uh, a humanist. So I'm not saying that it will take one day to turn Hamas from a terrorist organization into that. But, I, uh, but, but no doubt that the Palestinians will have to figure out how Hamas is turning into a political uh, party, which is not a terrorist organization. Of course, there will be criteria who could participate in elections, of course. Uh, and I know that even in the past, there were some agreements between Hamas and, uh, and Fatah that uh, Hamas could live with the technocrat uh, uh, you know, administration where they will not be represented and they will actually let Fatah lead uh, on, on those issues. So it's not impossible. It, it will take time. But uh, just, you know, for all of us to, to realize that I think that two weeks ago or something like that, we had the first Sinn Féin uh, leader of Northern Ireland. And Sinn Féin used to be the IRA, a terrorist organization, according to the, to the English. And now Sinn Féin is now a respected po politician who lead Northern Ireland in the, in the UK uh, parliament. So uh, in order to make this change in Hamas, we have to create a completely different structure of incentives. Um, and uh, I believe that uh, this plan is eventually going to change Hamas. Now, will Israeli politicians be happy about this? It will take them time. Don't re I, I remember that even Rabin, when he started Oslo, he was far away from where he ended. Uh, and even my boss, Shimon Peres, uh, did not mention a Palestinian state when he started. So it will be a process. But this process, will, if it will be led by, by the US, especially when people like Gantz and Eisenkot and Lapid unlike Smotrich and Bengvir, understand, uh, you know, the importance of the bilateral relations with the U.S. and they will follow American leadership. So even if now we will hear a lot of uh, 
things, I do believe that it shouldn't uh, stop uh, the U.S. from leading, uh, and eventually the Israelis will come around. Thanks so much, Nadav. Um, and uh, on the note of, uh, of, of public opinion, um, where, Deborah, where do you see uh, American Jewish support? Uh, does it exist for what we are outlining? Um, and then I want to stay with you and ask you a question that relates to to the broader region. Great. Uh, so let me start. Let me start with this. You know, J Street just released this proposal. We have not, of course, done polling on it. We have not done polling uh, subsequent to October seventh. Now. All of that said, we should also note that, of course, Jews are a very, American Jews are a very, very broad tent. Uh, if you have, it's always said, if you have, you know, two Jews, you have at least three opinions and, and all of that. So, you know, and without a doubt, there are going to be those on the right within the Jewish American community uh, that will not be interested in this proposal, just as, quite frankly, there are those on the left who have moved on uh, from the notion of, of a two-state solution at this point uh, to, to other alternatives. Uh, at the same time, though, we know that from you know, prior J Street polling, admittedly before October 7th, that within the Jewish American community, there is broadly support for a two-state solution that addresses the needs of both peoples uh, and for Palestinian statehood. Uh, we have done polling in the past. The most We do polling every two years. So we last did it in 2022. Um, that indicates that if you give Jewish Americans, Jewish American voters specifically is who we, we poll, if you give them a specific package along the lines of proposals that have been made in previous rounds of negotiations, uh, that gets overwhelming uh, support. I think, I don't have the numbers in front of me, I think it's a super majority of Jewish Americans um, support proposals like that. I just want to add, we also know uh, that there is high support among Jewish Americans, more than more than other communities, perhaps any other community, uh, for President Biden, that just as President Biden has banked a tremendous amount of goodwill with Israelis, as Nadav has discussed, in terms of his support for Israel since October 7th, that is also true among Jewish Americans, who at this point trust that Joe Biden is someone who has love for Israel in his kishkas, if you will. He passes the kishkas test. Um, he cares tremendously for Israel and its long-term security. And so I think if the Biden administration is leading a push like this, is making very clear that it is in long-term, Israel's long-term interest, which we certainly believe it is, I certainly believe there will be substantial Jewish American support for what we're proposing. And here at J Street, we will do all that we can, of course, to make sure that that's the case. Thanks, Deborah. I'm going to stay with you for, for another question that relates to, to the broader region. Obviously, one of the things that we have been tracking and has been on our radar is the potential for regional escalation. Um, and we have been encouraging um, the U.S. administration to take smart steps that relate both to uh, deterrence, but also to prioritizing diplomatic means to uh, prevent a regional escalation. Uh, do you see this framework uh, as helping to address uh, the Iranian uh, influence and sort of the axis of resistance, uh, as it has been called, and the different actors uh, in the region? How do you see this type of a proposal uh, affecting the uh, Iran question? Thanks for that. And it's certainly an important question. And we know uh, that the current conflict has uh, emboldened and empowered uh, some of those Iranian-supported uh, groups around the region, uh, those in Iraq and Syria, in Lebanon, of course, you have Hezbollah, uh, in addition, of course, uh, to Hamas, the Houthis in the Red Sea. Uh, there's there, a panoply of these, of these uh, very problematic groups that are all supported by uh, Iran and who have really been emboldened in, uh, through this 
uh, through this horrific conflict since October 7th. Uh, the question is, how, how do you deal with that going forward? And I think the answer is that you have to create an alternative to this axis of resistance. And this is exactly what we're talking about, right? The establishment of a Palestinian state that is led by moderate Palestinians who, you know, who are willing to agree to things like demilitarization of a Palestinian state. Um, note again that what we are proposing here is part of a broader comprehensive regional approach. And so you have not only Israel, which has a tremendous interest, as does the US, right, in disempowering Iran's influence and this access of resistance, but you also have the Arab states, the Gulf states, Egypt, Jordan, et cetera, who share in that interest. And so by bringing about regional normalization, part of which of course is Israeli-Palestinian conflict resolution, it will be a tremendous blow uh, to that very access of resistance. And so that's how we see dealing with this issue going forward. Thanks so much, Deborah. Um, all right, I'm going to ask a last question of Nidal and Nadav uh, together. Um, and I, I would love to hear from your perspective, what would Israelis and Palestinians like to see um, from this type of a proposal that engages the international community and regional actors that might not have been included in what we have outlined? Are there other items or other specific actions that Israelis or Palestinians would be interested in, in seeing and uh, receiving guarantees related to? So let, Nadal, I'll start with you and then I'll go to you, Nadal. Yeah, yeah, you know uh, the the proposal the proposal dealing directly with the issue of recognition. I I believe uh, a roadmap towards the two state solution will be extremely important for the Palestinians. Uh, just a theoretical a theoretical declaration or a statement from the side of the United States. And then that's it. Definitely will not be the ultimate goal when it comes to the Palestinian needs and demands. But a plan also on how both sides should progress towards reaching to the an end game settlement, towards the real realization of the two state solution towards the end of conflict, end of claims, and the issue of reconciliation. So the United States role should not end, and it has never been, you know, in, in the past, uh, being, being a mediator, but leaving the whole task to both Palestinians and Israelis to engage bilaterally and di directly without trying to put some details and flesh here and there, definitely all the time contributed to the failure of the process. The Palestinians do not need and should not actually try another process which will not take them anywhere. And I believe the United States can believe a significant role in defining also the contours of a meaningful future process. And by the way, this will attra attract significantly other players. Definitely, you know, the potential normalizers, but the rest of the regional players. And by this, definitely this vacuum, which has existed for the last decade will end. You know, you know those radical forces are filling the vacuum which the United States left behind and unfortunately, as a result, we are into a situation where we don't know and we are doing the, our utmost, both Palestinians and Israelis and the whole international community and to get out of this virtuous circle, but unfortunately, to no avail. Definitely, on this, the United States can play a significant role and can guide also the process. Thank you, Nidal. Uh, Nadal. So I think that there are a few anxieties that uh, Israelis have that uh, the U.S. could help uh, uh, mediate. Um, 
One, of course, the one of them is security. In terms of security, I think that there are two things that the U.S. could do um, even more than the demilitarized uh, uh, Palestinian state, which, which, as far as I know, was accepted by Palestinians. It was accepted even in, in Abu Mazen talks with the Olmert and in many other cases. Um, but one of the things that uh, Secretary Kerry did uh, was a plan uh, led by uh, General Allen, who was the leader of the of NATO forces in Afghanistan, and that plan was how to replace the IDF in a situation where where there is no um, uh, military left, especially on the Jordan River. And he came out with a plan that has to do with a lot of uh, you know regional uh, stuff, with a lot of technology, and with American uh, presence, not necessarily soldiers, but uh, American uh, presence uh, uh, on the ground. Um, uh, to that, I would add that I think that uh, uh, the, the consideration of uh, some kind of an alliance uh, that Israel should have, uh, kind of like Korea or, uh, uh, or Taiwan, um, for many years, Israelis did not want that because they said, you know, that will tie our hands. I believe that now when they see that uh, we we're, we're, could be surrounded uh, by Iran, by Hezbollah, by the Houthis, by the uh, militias, uh, Shia militias in Iraq and Syria, uh, from all, I think that this could make uh, Israelis feel uh, more secure about the American commitment, especially after the anxiety that Israelis and many others left, many pro-Americans, when uh, the pivot to Asia, that, that the U.S. is leaving the Middle East, and, and we want the, the U.S. to be the Middle East. We don't trust uh, uh, Putin or the Chinese, uh, definitely not the Iranian, to fill that vacuum. So the, those two security commitments. Other two things that I think uh, could happen is that uh, when in this Security Council resolution, alongside saying that Palestine will be the homeland of the Palestinian people. A statement that Israel is the homeland of the Jewish people, uh, of course, with democracy to other minorities, uh, will deal with the anxiety of Israelis that the, the refugee issue will eventually flood Israel uh, and it will not remain a homeland for the Jewish people. And it was even one of the things Netanyahu said in his Bar Ilan speech, even though he didn't mean it, that the two things that he wanted is a recognition of Israel as a, as a Jewish state and uh, the militarization. So he cannot get it from the Palestinians because you cannot expect the Palestinians to sign on the Zionist narrative, but you could get it from the, from the uh, United Nations, just like uh, in the you know, in 181 uh, when Israel was created. Uh, so, uh, and the last thing, which also uh, had to do with the refugees, there is a lot of anxiety with UNRWA. And UNRWA is an organization that is kind of rewarding refugee hunt. And uh, I think that with a Palestinian state, if the, if the international community could give the Palestinian state the uh, resources and uh, abilities, capacity to deal with the refugees in uh, in uh, Gaza, in the West Bank, and in East Jerusalem, while uh, turning the um, the uh, uh, responsibility for the refugees in Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, to U to the United Nations uh, General uh, Refugee Organization, I think that this could be good to empower the Palestinian state, but it will also deal with the Israeli anxiety about UNRWA and the re and the refugee issue. Thanks, Nadav. Um, a lot more to uh, to unpack with all of those things, and also, of course, with what uh, with what Nadal had laid out. And I and we're at the top of the hour, so we do need to close. And there, I know, are a million questions left that we didn't answer, and a lot of them relate to a lot of very very specific details. And I just want to e echo what Deborah said earlier, which is about the negotiations that need to take place, direct negotiations that take place to sort out a lot of these issues that relate also to the nature of. Of the demilitarization of the state of Palestine and relate also to uh, cooperation agreements between uh, between the two countries and natural resources um, and the status of settlements and borders and Jerusalem, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so while that's not included in our three-page proposal, we, we do believe that those are important issues that do need to be tackled. Um, and I just want to end on, the, on a final note, which is, um, you know, relating to step one of our proposal, which is 
that the only way that we can move forward in advancing um, this type of a proposal is if we um, secure a stop in fighting and prioritize the release in hostages, the surge of, of aid to Palestinians in Gaza, um, and work um, on these negotiations to lay out this comprehensive regional peace initiative. And that can only happen once we do re re reach a negotiated stop to the fighting. So um, this is uh, with hope that we will get there. I know that the United States is actively engaged, um, and uh, and we hope uh, only to have uh, good news soon, or sorotovot, as they say in Hebrew. Um, and thank you all for for being with us and for your excellent questions. And Nidal and Nadav and Deborah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we could do this for another several hours. I know. Uh, I really appreciate your insights. Thank you so much. Thanks, Adina. Thank you, Adina.